Hi guys, my name's Kirky, I'm, I'm a military historian and today we're going to look at some military artefacts but through these series we're going to look at First World War, Second World War, we're going to look at helmets, uniforms, weapons, documentation that was used in all these wars. Um, today I'm going to bring you on to helmets, this is the first one we're going to do. Okay, so we're going to compare the British airborne helmets to the German helmets. Okay, what we're going to do then is we're going to start with the German helmet, right? This helmet here is a, a German M35 helmet, so it's the first of the German, we'll call Nazi series helmets, uh, very indicative of the First World War helmets that were um, won uh, in the 1940-1980 wars. The only difference is, is they took away the the um, uh, air vents on the side that was used to, to hook onto uh, armour plates to give it extra armour. Um, by the time Hitler came into power, um, he wanted to reduce the helmet size down, uh, and that was all to do with um, the way metal became quite scarce and you see these helmets come through from the m35 all the way through the m42 uh, and they get slightly better printed if you'd like to put it that way better pressed okay so today we're going to look at this one this is the m35 so this one actually came out of france it was used in the battle of france it's called a uh, m35 double decal helmet and the reason for this is it's got two decals on it's got the national party decal on this side here as you can see just through the paint just there yeah and on the other side it has the Wehrmacht eagle which is just there with a swat sticker underneath okay as you can see from the texture it was found it was um, it was a dug uh, relic helmet um, it's missing its leather on the inside but it's got the um, uh, the aluminium uh, band on the inside and it's got like a folded edge you can see there the folded edge all the way around very indicative of the M35 and M42 uh, M40 sorry by the time they got to the M42, they stopped doing that because of the manufacturing process to make them better, uh, to make them quicker, quicker to press. Yeah. This on the inside of here would have a, a leather um, suspension system with a leather strap. Um, the British didn't really go with the leather type materials. They did have some leather, but not a lot. They started with the leather, which we'll see in a minute, um, but they then moved to webbing because they found that when uh, leather got sweaty and it got wet it tend to shrink uh, pulling the helmet and it was very hard to get the helmet strap on the Germans stayed with the leather strapping system all the way through the war helmet there then is uh, indicative of the green the green painted so this looks like it's been repainted over by the soldiers they did that quite a lot to change with their uh, environment that they were in as I said this was found in France in the battle of uh, from one of the battles in France against the French near the, uh, the uh, Maginot line um, but it's yeah a lovely helmet uh, and they're quite expensive. Uh, anybody that knows that collects these kinds of things, they cost quite a bit of money. Um, but as we've moved on, the British stuff is now getting more and more expensive. So what we're going to look at next is what the British did. So the British obviously had the Tommy helmets, which I haven't got here today, because I mainly focus on airborne forces, being an ex-airborne forces soldier myself. So this is the um, uh, Mark II. So the Mark II helmet is slightly different to the Mark One. The Mark One there was a there was three there was three types. There was the P type, which had a uh, a rubber bumper on the rear, and this was all designed for when they were jumping out with the Whitley bombers because we didn't always have Dakotas or gliders at the beginning of the war, especially going into what biting. They had a leather bumper on the back. Um, what the lads found, and that was to stop them from um, hitting their heads onto the. Um, onto the aircraft as they were bailing out of it because they jumped through the Bombay door which was a small door in the bottom um, there's a really good account from um, uh, Johnny Frost about um, him s sat actually in the Whitley bomber uh, and, and saying about the lads banging the heads off the back which was banging the heads off the front um, so the lads tended to cut the bumpers off the back so they went from that onto the Mark 1 um, which looked very similar to this it's got what they call um, a fibre rim helmet it's got a, a small bit of fiber. If I just move this netting here, it's got fiber that runs around and it was like a bumper. They then realized that that actually doesn't do anything and they took it off and went on to Mark III, which we'll look at in a minute. So they started with the, the leather suspension system on it with the chin, chin cup and it was a two piece um, suspension system that buckled through and it, it tightened it to the face to stop it from coming off. Because obviously when you jump out of an aircraft, the wind shear hits you quite quickly. Uh, and it tended to push the heads back and it, it was quite a jolt um, it's got a, a leather band on the inside this is actually a 1942 um, helmet with the um, uh, with a, um, a rubber pad on the inside uh, and a webbing suspension system in the top they then 
as the war moved on um, and it became um, resources became quite tight with the um, Kriegsmarine knocking out um, naval vessels and stuff coming from America they moved on to the Mark III uh, and you tend to find this one here in Arnhem so when you see a lot of the uh, Arnhem guys they, they tended to wear this mark of helmet obviously as the war went on and we got into uh, Operation Varsity they went to the Mark III the Mark III helmet is completely different this one has got a slightly later system in it um, but it's the same as the World War II one which has got the leather band on the inside and it's got the Zorbo um, uh, rubber uh, to obviously um, uh, protect the head and then it, they went to a webbing system so the webbing system was exactly like the webbing that they used on their uh, webbing all the way through the war the Germans stuck with leather webbing they went to canvas webbing when they were in um, Africa but the, genuinely when you see um, German soldiers they're wearing the leather all the war films that you watch you, you'll see that so they got the webbing system the webbing system was designed so it was secure to the head but also it doesn't shrink when it's wet uh, and everybody knows when your chin cup gets wet it's it's rats to put on okay again it, it, we still got the suspension system on the inside with the with the uh, webbing on the inside again it doesn't change that much it's just this bit here that's really changed um and it was it was more for security of the helmet this one was actually used after the war um for what looks like for p company with the see the numbers on the front uh, and we used these all the way up until we went to the falkland islands it's a slightly darker greener color than this one because it's been overpainted. so you generally you often find that these helmets as they went through different um upgrades that the paint colors changed this one's got like a, a sandy type paint on it uh, where this is more smooth it would have probably had some sand flex still in it uh, from the old stuff because they would have just over painted it there is other helmets so we will cover other helmets as we go through this series um, but I, these are the three these are my, my pride and joy three that I've brought in for you today to have a look at um, there'll be more information uh, on the on the website as we go through uh, and some uh, close-up pictures of this but um, thank you very much for watching uh, and I hope to see you again soon um, like I said, next time we'll get some machine guns out. I've got some documentation and, and, and uniforms for us to have a look at. So thanks very much for watching and we'll see you again soon.